Hey there everyone, Mr. Lewis here, ready to go through sections 3.3, 3.4, and 3.5 today of Unit 3. So let's get into it. 3.3 is titled Long Run Production Costs. So what do we mean by the long run? As opposed to the short run, where firms are more inelastic, meaning they can't really change much about their current operations and their inputs and things like that, in the long run, we have a lot more flexibility because there's a longer period of time for us to act, right? So firms are more elastic, and because of that, all inputs and costs are really variable, right? Everything is variable because we're talking about a large space of time in which a lot of changes could be made, even to things that in the short run would be considered fixed. So as I showed you in section uh, 3.1, if we look at the bottom output curve here, this is a product curve, this is representing uh, one year's productivity, right? But if in an entire year, we can add technology and human capital and, and a, wor a larger workforce and all those things, in the long run, we can increase that overall output, our overall potential production. So a couple other things that I wanted to talk about with long run costs versus short run. And, and honestly, there's a lot of similarities. As we look at average total cost or, or fixed cost or variable and those things, that's all the same. It's just short run versus long run. One is less flexible than the other. But we also talk about in the long run two other concepts, one of them being returns to scale. So returns to scale is referencing the relationship between inputs and outputs. And there's really only three labels we can give it. Increasing returns to scale, constant returns to scale, or decreasing returns to scale. So here's what this means in terms of input versus output. You can see the increasing returns curve here, right? And we have output on the y-axis, but input on the x-axis. So as we're hiring more workers, for example, that would be input, labor, we are able to generate a greater output. But what you can see from the more vertically inclined increasing returns curve, we only added maybe you know a couple extra workers or whatever, and our production shot up really quickly. What increasing returns to scale means is that the added input is less than the added output. Meaning, we might only hire, say, one more worker, but they give us 100 more units of output or something like that, that is increasing returns, right? We are seeing greater additions in output than we are to input. So with constant returns to scale, it's basically like we are uh, on a, on a um, constant one to, not one to one, but, but a, a constant increase in output as we add more input. So, so there's this uh, constant return on our input, right? It's a constant return on our investment, so to speak. And then finally, decreasing returns is just the opposite. As we add input, we have to add a lot of inputs just to get a little bit of output. So we're getting decreasing returns from the workers that we're hiring. And you can see here at the beginning of this curve, like we were getting increasing returns, but then, it started to flatten out because we're experiencing decreasing returns. So returns to scale is a way to compare input and output. This, on the other hand, economies of scale, is a way to compare output to average cost. So LRAC just represents long run average cost, meaning average total cost, ATC. So LRAC is just in the long run. And, and in the long run, we can judge where a company is based on how their average cost of production is changing. And if you recall, average cost of production is the total cost divided by the output. So what are we spending total amount of money? What are we spending per unit produced? So on average, per unit, what are we spending? And if as we create more product, our average total cost decreases. That means we're in something called economies of scale. As output is increasing, ATC is going down. This is usually true for young companies, right? 
because they start with these big startup costs early on, like the ship that we talked about. If we're starting a shipping company, I got to buy a fleet of cargo ships. So as we produce, though, that average cost starts to come down. We get more efficient. Then eventually you get to a point in your business where you are experiencing constant returns to scale. Now, this is different okay, from what we talked about here. This was referring to added input and added output, right? But it's kind of the same idea in the sense that with constant returns to scale on the ATC curve, as output increases, ATC is staying the same. So it's, re it's reversed. We're not talking about as, as we're changing input. We're talking about as we're changing output. As we're increasing output, average cost is staying the same. This is also what we call minimum efficiency scale. Finally, we get to a period of our business where we're experiencing diseconomies of scale. With diseconomies of scale, as output increases, ATC also increases. That's not a very good place to be because as we want to produce more, um, we're going to have to pay more per unit. So we should maybe scale back, right? So that's how we might measure average total cost in the long run. There's a downward sloping portion, economies of scale. There's a constant portion, and there's an increasing portion. All right, moving on into 3.4 and 3.5. And these are pretty quick, but this is all about profit. And we want to talk about two things with profit, two different types of profit, and then how to maximize profit. So we've talked a lot about costs. What about the other side of things? There are two types, as I mentioned, accounting profit and economic profit. Accounting profit is not one that we typically use. You may be asked about it, but when we're talking about the perspective of a firm, of a, of a company, we're not taking into account in this class this type of profit. We always use economic profit. Here's why. Accounting profit does not take implicit cost into account. Things like opportunity cost, right? Money that you might be sacrificing, opportunities you might be sacrificing, time and effort and energy that you have to put in, risk, things like that. So therefore, accounting profit is always greater than economic profit because there's a cost that they're leaving out. With economic profit, on the other hand, we include both explicit and implicit costs. So all the money that's in front of us and the money that is wrapped up in opportunity cost, we include all of that. And so in perfect competition, because we include all of these implicit costs, in perfect competition in the long run, all firms, all companies earn zero economic profit. This is referred to as normal profit. Now keep in mind, that means they're still covering every single cost, right? Explicit and implicit. They're paying all their workers. They're covering their opportunity cost. They're paying for everything they have to. They're just not earning anything extra after all is said and done. They, their total revenue is equal to their entire total cost, explicit plus implicit. So that's not a bad place to be because you're paying for everything you need to, your materials, the cost of doing business, all your workers, insurance, and your opportunity costs. So you're earning normal profit. This is always true for firms in perfect competition in the long run, zero profit. So we focus on economic profit. And there's a couple ways to calculate that, really. There's a total approach. There's an average approach. The total approach, if you have total revenue and you have total cost, just subtract total cost from total revenue. And that's going to give you your economic profit or loss or break even or whatever it might be. But we can also look at the average, right? And if we know, in this case, the per unit profit, which can be written two ways. One would be the average revenue per unit minus the average cost per unit. Sometimes though price is what you get, not average revenue, but they're essentially the same thing, right? What you're getting for each unit that you're uh, selling. So in this case, on the bottom, we would have price minus ATC. So this is the profit per unit. What you get, the price, what you spent, average total cost, and then we just multiply by the number of units, quantity, to get our total profit. So there's a few different ways we can calculate that, but the real goal is maximizing profit. So 
How do we do that? It goes back to our marginal principle. The marginal principle helps us maximize profit by finding the level of output where MR equals MC, where the marginal benefit is equal to the marginal cost. We've used this quite a few times now. Or at the last unit where the marginal revenue is greater than or equal to the marginal cost. That's another way you can think about it. And that's how we should think about it in this particular case because look what we have here. We've got output one through four. Price is constant at $2. Total revenue is just output times price. So one times two, two, two times two, four, three times two, six, four times two, eight. Marginal revenue is the added revenue with each new unit. Because the price is constant at $2, so is marginal revenue. Total cost, on the other hand, goes from one to 225 to four to seven. So what we want to do is look at marginal cost. How does it change from one to the next? A dollar, we go from zero to one, assumingly at, at uh, uh, zero output there. We're just assuming there was no cost, so it's all variable, and we're just adding in this one dollar. But more importantly than that, it goes to 225. So 125 is our marginal cost, one to 225. And then it goes to four. So 175 is our marginal cost. Then it goes to seven. So our marginal cost is three, four to seven. If you think about our marginal revenue constant at $2, we should just be comparing that marginal revenue to marginal cost each unit to determine if we should produce another unit. So you can see over here, the last column, it says decision. Basically what we're doing is comparing MR to MC and making a decision. Two is greater than one, produce another unit. Two is greater than 175, produce another unit. 2, excuse me, 125. 2 is greater than 125. Produce another unit. 2 is greater than 175. Produce another unit. 2 is not greater than 3. Uh-oh, wait, go back. We should stop at 3 units of output before the marginal revenue of 2 becomes less than the marginal cost of 3. And if you look at our profit, you can see that $2 is the highest profit we have here. 1, 175, 2, 1. So we should definitely stop at three units because that's where profit is greatest and that's what the marginal principle helps us do. And it's not just in a chart like this. It could also be on a graph. Any type of graph that you have uh, where you have the marginal cost curve labeled as MC over here and the marginal revenue curve labeled as MR over here Wherever those two things meet, it is so easy because we can just say, oh yeah, that's the quantity where this firm is maximizing their profit. And I know that because the marginal principle tells me, and I can see that those two curves intersect there. And literally there's no other point where they do. So in this graph, for example, they must be maximizing profit at Q. In this graph, they must be maximizing profit at QPM, the profit maximizing quantity, right? because that's where MC and MR meet. So remember that in perfectly competitive markets, and we're gonna talk about this uh, uh, as we move forward, we're gonna practice this a lot more. Marginal revenue is consistent. The reason is price is never changing because no firms have actual power in perfect competition as we've discussed previously. So if no firms actually have any power, then they're all just gonna charge the same price, right? They can't charge more than one another. The marginal cost curve, as we talked about yesterday, always takes on this J shape. So in this case, with perfectly competitive firms, not a perfectly competitive market, but just the individual firm, this is what their marginal revenue curve is gonna look like, and this is what their marginal cost curve looks like. Wherever those two things meet, that is the profit maximizing quantity for that perfectly competitive firm. So that's it for today. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you tomorrow, guys.